painting with a colored light. So this demo is is going to we're going to start off with just talking about the 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 opening sort of moments here and then we'll get into some more detail. The the way that I'm starting the picture here, uh, I'm just trying to get organized. So I decided to start the painting off in a way that was the most efficient and fastest for me. I, as a as a teacher, I usually recommend that students start with an underpainting where they resolve the drawing in one color so they're not distracted. But whenever I do a demo, I, I usually just break one of my own rules right off the bat and then it's awkward from there on out. And those of you who know me know that, so nothing here is a surprise. But this is just me blocking things in because my plan for the painting is to just to get organized so I know where my big values are, my big color shapes are, and then I can start worrying about the color. Because this painting is ultimately about color for me. Um, I gave myself the job of also trying to keep the painting a little bit more impressionistic. In fact, this demo was originally for an impressionism project. And what I learned from it is that it's it's really hard to just sit down and make an authentically impressionist painting if you don't do that all the time. Now I can get close, but I don't really think that this painting turned out to be very impressionistic at all. Um, what I did with my brushwork was um, I made sure that I I maintained one brush stroke at a time so that I wasn't constantly blending or pushing the paint around. And then I just tried to paint as directly as I could. Um, but also I made sure that I would, you need to slow down the, the, the frame here. You can see I'm using hog's bristle brushes for most of the, the brush work that I'm doing. And then if, if I have a smaller mark or an edge I need, that's where I, I come in with a sable brush like that one. But um, on occasion, I'm slowing the film down here so that you guys can see the pace I'm actually working at. Because otherwise, these are 2,000% um, speed. So you can see here how slowly I'm actually working, and then I'm painting like a chipmunk here. But the, the thing with the Impressionist approach was... Um, I just intended to get organized and then just work up the surface and develop the color at the same time. But the painting didn't really go that way. I was kind of surprised at how challenging certain passages were. Um, but this is my first attempt at uh, resolving certain passages. And, and mostly the reason I started with the apples is because I was afraid that something was going to happen to them, like they would start to rot or whatever, and I would run out of time. So. I normally follow a process where I work from outside in. And you're going to, just because it's a demo, uh, I ended up doing everything backwards and wrong. And uh, so on some level, most of the first half of the video is just me making mistakes and then getting reorganized around them. And then once I get to a place where I can actually work those details up, then things start to come together. But uh, while we're waiting for that, um, I guess I'm doing glass right now. And the thing is, I think that I have the values right right now. And I realize in the next sitting that the table is too light and that the glass is actually darker than the table, which is weird, cause, or uh, lighter than the table, which is weird because that's not what you'd expect. You'd expect the glass to be darker than the table, and it's no big deal. But I find out the opposite is true, and then uh, in the next couple frames, I start working on that. But while we, uh, we wait for that to happen, what I wanted to talk about was the color of the light. And as an exercise, changing the color of your light source to something unusual is, uh, is an interesting, it's an interesting exercise you can learn a lot from it, and even if you just get some goofy, weird painting like this one out of it, what you can what you can get out of that is the practical uh, aspects of what of just how light actually works. So, I used 
from the very opening frame, you can see my lamp with a red colored film over it. So my light source is red. And I was kind of determined to not let things get too red overall for the painting. I kind of wanted to make a painting where the viewer wouldn't know that the light source was red, but I was going to get to take advantage of all the cool things that happen when you mess around with your light source. So what happens with your light is that if you have a red light source, the cast shadows from that are going to be green. And it turns out that that's the case with every light source. The color of the cast shadows is going to be the complement of the color of the light. So when you're generating shadow colors, what you want to do in any situation is say, what is the color of the light? And then what is going to be the complement of that color? And then make sure there's some local color and make sure there's something dark. So... Uh, we'll come back to the, the, the paper where that's the best place in the painting where the color of the light and the shadow actually start uh, to, to make their presence known. Um, so I'll come back to that. But here, I'm redoing the table, now realizing that the whole table needed to be much darker. And so you can see I'm, I'm mixing up my purples. I'm keeping them different from front to back, left to right and I'm using a lot of paint, and I'm just, I, I realized that the, the blue table needed to be a lot redder. And since my shadows are cool and actually green, the, the green shadow doesn't really show up on the blue very much, it just looks blue. So um, instead of using ultramarine blue to work up the shadow, I used Prussian blue, and that kept the shadows, cast shadows on the table on the green side. And then when I went uh, outside that, I, I just used ultramarine blue to keep the, shadow, uh, the, the light colors on the table um, nice and warm. But what this does is it organizationally it gets me to a place where I can get the values inside the bottle right. Um, and I hate how complicated this got because I, I want a demonstration painting to be nice and simple and straightforward. Um, and this, this makes it look like I'm struggling to explain it, where really I'm just trying to keep up with the, um, the film and what you're seeing at the moment. But the bottom of the bottle actually does get pretty dark. So uh, I, I, that's where I started, because I wanted to make sure I got the deepest darks right. And then uh, as I move up through the bottle, I'm getting my lightest lights and my darkest darks in. And then I can move up to the top. But right now, I'm just like, I've got everything where I want it in these passages. And I'm just working up the surface, just kind of playing around with uh, the sort of impressionistic mark making. And up in here, this is where, as the table gets further away, the general value of the glass actually gets lighter. So there's some deeper darks at the top, but the edge of the glass is much lighter. And that was what I was setting up by redoing the table. And now I've got the plate, and I'm just getting reorganized inside the glass. And trying to keep my marks singular and keep the color complex and sort of rework some of the drawing all at once. Um, there's a lot going on there. But once I got organized, this painting was really fun. And it didn't really pose that many crazy problems. See here, I realized that the green, there's a, there's a Granny Smith apple, a green apple, behind the bottle that you can't see outside the bottle. And so I realized that the green of the apple on the left and the Granny Smith that was inside the bottle were exactly the same color. Like, not intentionally, but they ended up being the same color. And that's the kiss of death when it comes to creating space and color complexity in your painting. If you repeat the same colors, especially when they're as important as those two greens surrounded by all those reds, the space in your picture just gets destroyed. So uh, when I saw that was what was happening, I had to come in and make some uh, fundamental changes. And here I'm trying to warm that green up by adding some red to it. Um, and then on the inside, the Granny Smith gets a little bit cooler. And that color is pretty good, but... Uh, I do believe I, I paint over it. Um, but I'm just trying to follow some of the rules 
as far as what you do with glass. And here I'm uh, fooling around with the speed on the camera. Um, but just trying to make little touches and little spots of light um, to get those distortions of the apples and everything else right. Um, in the other version of this painting I have that I did on copper, I actually have a bunch of writing on the glass. So I'm doing all the same things as I'm doing here, but I also have some uh, some some text that I uh, that I wrote in that that it just has to do with uh, some ideas I was kicking around. But those don't matter right now. But um, uh, if you get a chance to see the other painting, it, uh, it's, it's very, very different from this one, even if I kind of used this painting as a study for the other painting that's on copper. This painting, incidentally, um, is on a piece of paper that has been shellacked, if that's of any interest to anybody. Because when we get some detail shots, you'll get to see some of the paper sort of texture coming through. Um, I've never been a big fan of canvas. Um, when I first started painting, I spent all my time fighting the canvas texture, and I, I always just really hated it. So anytime I, I have an opportunity to paint on something other than canvas, I'm, I'm usually all over it. So that little spot of orange on the left, that's the apple on the left that you can see. And um, I'm just trying to warm everything up because I'm, I'm realizing that there's a warm light source again and trying to make sure that that um, comes together. So now we're back to the to the paper and you can see where my cast shadow, like the part I'm working on right now is direct light. So there's a lot of really sort of brighter, warmer reds. And then just to the left of that, you can see that cast shadow area where it's all various greens that lean towards blue. And theoretically, that's what you're supposed to be seeing. But in reality, what happens in a shadow is that you have the, the, the cool, if your light source is warm, you have a cool, dark shadow, but you also have reflections inside it. And what I found was that there was lots, there were lots of warm colors inside the shadow as well. They just needed to be slightly cooler than what was outside. And so you can see that right, that green stripe that goes right to the left of the passage I'm working on now. But then as we get further to the left, uh, there's, there's a passage that's just against the ground or the table that's, that leans more towards purple. And that's the reflection of the table playing a role. So where there are warm colors inside the other shadows, that's the red of the lights. Um, on the paper, the direct lights on the paper reflecting red into the shadows and bouncing around, and then uh, down further on the left, that's the table bouncing, uh, the light from the table bouncing back up. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm trying to slow things down so you can see how, what my pace actually is. I know these videos make it look like things get done very quickly, um, but this painting took a really long time. I, I probably had 10 different sittings where uh, I worked at this same pace. And this is the most fun part for me because I just get to I just get to play around with the color. Everything is where it's supposed to be. I've drawn as much as I'm going to draw if this was ever supposed to be kind of an impressionist painting. The drawings aren't the drawing isn't really precise, but it's not wrong. And so I was able to uh, get myself to a place where everything is nice and organized. And, uh, and that was the last little stroke. So here we're, we're winding things down and I just wanted to go through and show uh, some detail shots. So that's the limit of my zoom. And so we're just gonna go through and, and very quickly look at some of, the, some of the paint because ultimately that was one of the ideas was to build up the surface the way the impressionists would have. And, and I, I do succeed a little bit, but um, I think if I was to do an impressionist approach again, I would not be doing a still life like this. I might, I have more fun with a portrait or something uh, or a landscape. But this, the surface area here that you're seeing, some of it is, it's it's a lot cruder and 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 more painterly than I'm than I normally work. But I, I was, I was trying to push that a little bit and. Uh, 
varying degrees of success. I, I don't think this painting is a masterpiece or anything. I, I really like the top apple. That's my favorite part of the painting. Um, but aside from that, uh, those, those were the big things I wanted to point out. So we're going to wrap it up from here. Thanks.